would love to share it with you all today. Once, a long, 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 long time ago, when the world was young, there was no mist, you know, the mist that swarms through the land, touching all the trees and the bushes. There was none of it, not a single ounce. But there was a man, and this man had a very strange job. He lived on top of a hill in a small house with his wife and five-year-old son. And every morning the man would wake up and turn to his wife, who was fast asleep, and plant a kiss on her cheek. And then he would tiptoe to his son's room, who was also fast asleep and embrace him ever so gently so as not to wake him. Then he would gather some stones, some sticks, and some matches, wrap them all up in a gray cloth, slug it over his shoulder, walk out the door, up the hill, past the gray oak tree, and into the world. Some days he would walk a mile, other days, two miles, sometimes even up to 10 miles before he found the marketplace. But once he did, it would fit, be filled with people talking and singing and shouting and all the different stalls. And so he would look for his spot. And once he found his spot, he would roll out the gray cloth and find his first audience member. He always looked for a child, a child under the age of six. And once he made eye contact, he lit the matches, caught his sticks on fire, and began to juggle. And the child would go, mommy, 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 come look. And the mother would call the husband, and the husband would call the sister, and the sister would call the friend. And a whole crowd would gather around him. And he would juggle and juggle and juggle, and an arc of smoke would appear above his head. And the crowd would roar with applause. And afterwards, he would hold out his hat for money. And people would toss in coins upon coins. And then he would walk all the way home, covered in suit, towards his favorite moment of the day, when he saw the great oak tree. Well, it wasn't that moment. It was the moment right after that because underneath the oak tree was his five-year-old son eagerly waiting for his father to return home. Now, he was five years old. He wasn't a baby, so he wasn't gonna just run to his dad. So he just stood there like a grown-up trying to contain all his excitement. And the fire juggler saw this and he began to slow down. And now the five-year-old just couldn't take it anymore and his heart was just bursting with joy and he would run towards the fire juggler and the father would pick up his son, spin him around and carry him all the way home. And once they got home, the husband and wife and son would sit around their dining table, eating supper and sharing stories. It was a simple life, but the fire juggler would not have had it any other way. One morning he awoke before the sun had even begun its ascent into the sky and he turned to his wife who was fast asleep and planted a kiss on her cheek. And then he tiptoed to his son's room who was also fast asleep and embraced him ever so gently so as not to wake him. Then he gathered all his supplies in a gray cloth, wrapped it up, slept it over his shoulder, walked out the door, up the hill, past the great oak tree, and into the world. That day, he walked 20 miles before he found the marketplace. But once he did, it was filled to the brim with people shouting and singing and talking. And so he looked for his spot. And once he found his spot, he rolled out the gray cloth and sought out his first audience member. 
Then once he made eye contact, he caught his sticks on fire and he began to juggle. And the child went, mommy, 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 come look. And the mother called the husband and the husband called the sister and the sister called a friend. And before he knew it, the whole marketplace was surrounding him. And he knew for a crowd of this size, he had to pull out all the stops. So he grabbed three machetes and he began juggling with the machetes and the fire and there was an arc of smoke above his head and the crowd began to clap, but he wasn't done yet. For his final act, he grabbed a live chicken, bop, 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 and he juggled the chicken and the machetes and the fire and the crowd roared and then once he was done, he held out his hat and people tossed in gold coins and silver coins and copper coins. His hat was almost bursting at the seams. And so he walked home. His arms were tired, but his heart was content because he knew his family would be able to live off this for a long, long time. So as he walked towards the great oak tree, awaiting his favorite moment of the day, as he walked towards the great oak tree, awaiting his favorite moment of the day, he noticed something was different because his five-year-old son was no longer standing there. And the fire juggler's heart dropped to his stomach and he began running towards his house and he burst through the door and the first thing he saw was his wife, tears streaming down her face. And the second thing he saw was his son lying down on the dining table, a snake bite on his arm. And so the wife turned toward her husband. She began crying and said, I don't know, it just happened so fast. And the doctor lives too far away. There's nothing that can be done now. And the fire juggler knew she was right. And he heard a noise outside the window and when he looked outside, he saw that the ground had began to open up. And from the ground, there was a flight of steps and climbing up those steps were the three sisters of death. He watched as they crossed the field. He watched as they walked through the door. He watched as they walked past the hearth and he watched as they reached their long bony fingers towards his son. And he knew something must be done. And so he grabbed his sticks, he shoved them into the fireplace, and he began to juggle. And well, the three sisters of death, where they came from in the underworld, it was cold and dark and dreary, and they had never seen such light and heat before. And so that small house was filled with the smoke and the flame from the fire juggler. And every time he threw a stick up into the air, pain would shoot up his arm. But he kept going because he knew for every moment he juggled was another moment his son would remain alive. And so he turned to the sister in the middle and said, I could do this forever. Take me instead of him. And while the three sisters of death, they looked towards the five-year juggler and they looked towards the five-year-old son. They nodded in agreement. And with that, the three sisters walked out the door, the fire juggler in tow. And right as he was about to cross the threshold, his wife screamed, no! And he turned with a sad smile and said, yes, remember me to our son. And so the three sisters of death and the fire juggler made their descent into the underworld and the ground began to close up. And while the five-year-old son, he began to cough <coughs> and his cheeks flushed red and his eyes opened wide. He was alive and he was well. The next morning when the mother and son woke up, they noticed that there was a mist swarming through the land, touching all the trees and the bushes. And the wife knew what that mist was. It was the smoke coming from the end of the fire juggler sticks through all the layers of the earth up the hill, past the great oak tree, and in 
to the world. And so now you know that whenever you see mist, it is merely a sign of a father's love for his son. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Gloria. You know, when it comes to a father, many of us feel like our dads are heroes. That father for sure was. Very much from a folktale type of a story, although written by that particular young lady that allowed Gloria to tell that story. You told it beautifully. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. We have a little mixture of stories, anecdotes, and poems. And Mark Bobineau is here to, to, to read out a, a poem that has to do with heroes. How about a hand for Mark? Okay, my brother wrote this, so I take no credit. Uh, I asked him, I said, hey, can you come up with a poem or something for heroes. And I'd ask him all week, he never did anything. And then uh, yesterday uh, he said, okay, I did this in five minutes. Doesn't have a title, Ray Bobino. I used to wish that I could fly. That's what heroes do, you know? They soar above the stratosphere, beyond our reach, away they go. They aren't real enough to see. A specter, just out of reach beyond the wall of fantasy, a wall I cannot breach. Earthbound, I concede, feet in the earth, wind in my face. I close my eyes before I leap or the wall to find my place. And in this new reality, my temporal flight alights. Here, my hero journey begins, piloted by eternal light. That's it. <laughs> That's it. What a beautiful poem. Tell your brother thank you. Oh my gosh. He's talented. That was and his five minutes. He said, I, I did this really quick. So. Well, you, you added the perfect touch to our evening. Thank, thank you. you so thank you. much. Thank you. Welcome. Our next teller. Um, just recently got back from Ireland, which is her, her home away from home. She actually spends probably almost half the year um, on a little island that she just loves and the pictures of her home and, and surroundings are just gorgeous. Someday we all have to go and visit Jane McDaniel's home in oh. Ireland. In the meantime, we visit her home quite often for our meetings before this COVID thing hit. And she serves us the Irish tea. She's amazing. Um, and she sticks to uh, telling just the way she talks to us. Reminds me of the old way of telling. You know, the true Irish culture of telling. And with that said, I believe Jane has a hero story that comes all the way from Ireland. Thank you, Jane. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Can you guys hear me all right? Okay, great. This is a story about one of Ireland's greatest heroes. It was Cormac MacArt, who was the High King of Ireland long, long ago in the sixth century thereabouts. He was High King of Ireland and he looked out, Cormac did, looked out over his land from the hill of Tara and he saw rich, fat, contented cows, fast horses, green fields, land of valorous deeds and great hunts, a land also of sweet music, songs which celebrated the feats of heroes and a land of quieter music of spinning wheels and spinning mills and of easy prosperity. He had one son, Carba, who was growing in strength and courage. He had a daughter, Alba, fair, gentle, dignified. She would be a fitting wife for a hero one day. And he had a clever, clever wife, Ethna, whose beauty had not faded over the years. 
and he had a small dark-eyed mistress who asked all the right questions. He stood on that hill of Tara and somehow he felt there was something missing. He was dissatisfied. He didn't know what it was. And as he looked out over the green fields of Tara, he saw in the distance, he saw a man coming. It was a young man, tall and thin and lithe, with long golden hair, and he carried something in his hand. And he heard, Cormac, heard music, some music that he had never heard before. It seemed to not come out of time, but but come from another land somehow. As he waited, the man got closer and he saw that the music was coming from a branch that he held. This branch had three golden and red apples. And as he shook it, oh, as he shook it, Cormac lost all rational thoughts. And as the young man came up close to him, he said, where are you from? What is your name? What is your station? And why do you make this music? And the young man just looked at him and smiled and shook the branch. And Cormac, who had lost all rational thoughts, said to him, I want that branch. I'll give it to me. Give it to me. I am king here. Give it to me. And the young man said, what will you give me for it? Cormac, who was High King of Ireland, said, I'll give you anything you want. I am a High King. I can fulfill any wish. The young man looked him straight in the eye and said, I would like three wishes. Yes, anything, anything. The young man handed him the branch and said, I will be back in a year and then I will tell you my first wish. And he left. And Cormac took that into his castle and played that music for everybody. And he saw as soon as the music was played with that branch, that all the sorrows of the world were gone and people were happy. After a year, the young man came back and he stood before Cormac. He said, my first wish, I want your daughter, Alba. Oh, no, you can't have my daughter, not my daughter. I love her. I love her more than the than the fields love the rain that falls on, on them after the sun has gone. But I have to have your daughter. And you promised, you promised. So he took Alba by the hand and went away with her. Not before saying, play the music. And Cormac shook that branch and played the music that it gave and all the sorrows were gone. It wasn't long before another year was over and the young man was back again. And he said, I've come for the second wish. What is it? I can give you anything, anything for my kingdom, said Cormac. I want your son. My son? My beloved only son? You can't have my beloved only son. But you promised. You said there were three wishes and this is my second wish. But my son... Shake that branch. Let the music play. The sorrow will go. And the young man took the son by the hand and walked off with him. And Cormac stood and shook that branch. Great sorrow in his heart. And he felt the joy come in and a peace. And it wasn't long before another year was by. And the young man came back and he said, my third and last wish I want your wife, Ethna. I want your wife, you've promised. No, don't take my wife, for she is dear to me, more dear than the rain and the sun and anything in the world. Don't break up my family. Do not take my wife. I will give you anything, anything else. The young man said, no, you promised. You gave me your word. And Cormac embraced his wife and cried and cried large tears. And the young man took her by the hand and walked away with her. Cormac said, I will give you back your branch. I will give you back your branch, he called after the young man. I will give you back your branch if you will only give me back my loved ones. And the young man smiled back at him and pointed to the branch. Cormac said, I will follow you. I will follow you to your, to your land. I will follow you to your palace. I will go in and I will, I, will take, I will take them by force if need be. 
or I will die in the attempt. So he journeyed. He started walking, following the young man, keeping him always in his sight, walking behind him for years and years and years and months. He walked behind that young man, keeping him in sight. And he walked always southwards through fields, over bogs, over mountains and over seas and over fields with golden rushes that shone in the light always southwards till he came to the land of Shi. And there he saw strange things. He saw horses that galloped over the waves. And he saw fairy horsemen who were thatching a great house with white feathers from white birds. And every time they did that, the wind came and blew them away. He saw a young man with lumber kindling and making a fire. And every time he went away and came back with wood, the fire had burnt to ashes. And then he saw a great house and it had a, a courtyard with a large fountain. And on the fountain, there were five streams that came down of clear, white, clear water that dropped down into the fountain where salmon swam and drank of the water. And then he saw a throne and on that throne sat a very beautiful lady and she had long long golden hair and she was tall taller than any woman he had ever seen and she had a, wore a crown of fishes with ruby eyes and he knew that she was the goddess Anya beside her sat the young man with his hair and he wore the same cloak of silver, silver lining and green. And when the sun caught it, it sparkled. And he recognized the young man and he said, I've come, I've come for my wife. I've come. He said, the young man said, I am Manana Maklir. And you are not too late. You are not too late. Your family is here and it is as if they have been here a day. They have not missed you. They have been happy. Give me back my family, said Cormac. Give me back my family or I will stay here. I will give up my kingdom and I will stay here just to be with them. And the young man who was Mananan Maklir and turned into an old, old man, fine with long gray hair and a, a crown of prancing horses with ruby, sapphire, eyes, emeralds that shone, the king of the sea. And he said, I have called you here to, to learn how to be just, and not just powerful, but just. I, I have taught you, I want to teach you to be wise. So go back to your kingdom and learn how to be wise and not just powerful. And the meaning of what you have seen, those horsemen who were trying to thatch that house with the white feathers that blew, those are the wealthy people who are always running and running and chasing after new things while the things that they own do not prosper and wither. And the young man with the tindling, who was make, kindling, who was making the fire, he is one who takes care of everybody else, but never of himself. And the fountain with the five streams, that is the wisdom fountain. Those five streams are the five senses. A person must partake of those five senses to learn the knowledge and the wisdom of the world. Now go back to your country. But Cormac stayed because he embraced his wife, his daughter and his son. And they stayed and they feasted and ate all that night. And when they woke up in the morning, they were standing on the green ramparts of Tara. Now, it is said that Cormac MacArt, High King of Ireland, became known as he of the long beard because of his wisdom. He lived to a great age. And there was music in his country and there was a beloved land that had had 
Oh, peace. But it is also said that when the cows in the evening in Ireland lie themselves down with a sigh in the fields as the sun goes down, that they are sighing for the contentment and the peace of old Ireland. And that's my story. How long was that? I hope it was eight minutes. <laughs> Oh, it's a long, complicated one. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much. Makes Thank you. Long, oh, who wants to go to Ireland? Raise your hand me, if you go to Ireland. Me, 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 me. Oh, that was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Jane. I know you kind of miss being there. <laughs> it's going to yes. be hard being back. Oh. Yes. Um, so. Back to heroes. I mean, that was pretty amazing. We we have uh, we we just had um, a legend, I believe, um, all the way from Ireland. We had a folk tale. Um, now um, we might have a, a hero in the form of an animal. I'm wondering if Nathan Holliner has a story having to do with heroes. Uh, yes, uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Okay. All right, Nathan, you are right. up. Okay. As you, as you all know, this COVID-19 pandemic is one of the worst events our world has ever known. And, the, and, and right now, there is a race to find the vaccine. This reminds me of a story about a race to, for, a, for, a fear, for a medicine to cure the citizens of the town of Nome, Alaska, and a race in, involving in honor of a famous dog who made it all possible. You probably may have all heard this story before, and, you, and it's a very good story. And this, the, this is the story of the bravest and most famous dog in the world. His name was Balto. One, once in 1925, way up in Nome, Alaska, there lived a sled dog named Balto. He lived a good life working as a sled dog. He brought the tools and foods to the miners who were working around in the mine, in the mine, working in the mines around Nome. It was a fun, perfect life for a sled dog. But however, that all changed when one winter, when the, when the winter of 1925, when something happened that would change his life forever. In 1925, there was a terrible pandemic in the town of Nome, Alaska. The, a serious disease called diphtheria was, was spreading throughout the town. It all it started when two children caught the, the disease and the doctor was very worried. He, he, he needed the medicine, but it was 800 miles away in the city of Anchorage, which is the largest city in Alaska. They decided and they knew that. And, and so they arranged they, the city of Alaska, Anchorage arranged um, a, a tra arranged a shipment of the medicine to the town of Nome. And so it was on its way. But about but after about a hundred miles, the train could go no further, for the tracks were buried deep in snow. And they still Anchorage was 800 miles away from Nome. And the train still had 700 more miles to go. Meanwhile, back in the town of Nome, all the citizens had a meeting of how they would get the medicine delivered in time, or delivered on time. Finally, one person stood up and announced, why don't we have a dog sled relay? And they all, and everyone agreed. But the, town, but the town doctor of Nome was not impressed. That would take only 15 days, he said. There's no way you can get it in time that fast. But still, everyone persisted. And at last, the mayor of Nome made an announcement. He called the best, the most skilled dog sleds 
in all of Alaska. And in the race, each of 21 dog sled teams would be needed to ship the medicine to the town of Nome. Whenever one team got tired, a second one and the next one would come in to take its place. And so it was scheduled. And Balto and his done his lead and his driver, Gunner, were, 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 were assigned for the task. And so the next day, the first driver picked up the medicine from where the train was stuck and he and he made the trip in record time. And then the next dog team picked it up and took it to the next town. However, during the course, a terrible storm blew up. The, the snow and wind were blowing so hard, it was very hard to see the trail. But that did not stop the dogs from ac accomplishing their mission. For one team, two dogs got froze to death in the harsh weather. And so the driver got off his sled, hitched up to the rest of the dogs, and finished the rest of the journey to the next stop. Meanwhile, Balto and his team were waiting in the town of Bluff. Gunner couldn't sleep. He had to get ready. He had to be ready to leave as soon as the medicine arrived. After two days, he heard barking in the distance. The medicine was here. Gunner immediately took the medicine, loaded it onto his sled, hitched up his dogs, and they set off into the snowy night. At first, they went just fine. At first, they went along just fine. But, but heavy snow blocked their paths and the dogs got stuck. All the dogs began to panic, ex except Balto. He just sat calm and that made all the other dogs feel better while Gunner dug them out of the snow. And, and soon they were on their way again. Before, before long, they came to a frozen river in the, the dogs and the sled slipped and skidded on the ice. At one point, the sled the at one point the sled tipped over and the medicine fell out. But Gunner quickly found dug it up out of the snow and they started on their way again. Suddenly, Balto stopped short. Gunner whined, Gunner urged him to go on, but Balto refused. And soon Gunner found out why. The ice was cracking. If they all fell into the water, they would all drown. So, so Gunner congratulated Brawl Balto for being so smart. But then he noticed that Balto's feet were, were wet. And if they froze, Balto would never walk again. So Gunner unhitched Balto and dried his paws in powdery snow. Then he hitched Balto back up and they were on their way again. They were on their way once again. Soon the, it, was, it was getting cold. By now it was getting colder and colder and the wind was blowing faster and faster. The snow was blowing so hard that Gunner could not see the trail. But Balto was not afraid for being the lead dog in his team he, he, he knew that he knew the trails very well. He had taken that route many times before. And so he pulled on ahead. At last, they came to the town of Point Break where their next to the last store to the last to or their next stop before Nome was to be to be held at. But when they got there, they found that the driver who was going to take the medicine for the rest of the journey wasn't there. Gunner didn't, didn't, couldn't understand why he was there, what had happened to him, but there was no time to find out. Time was running out. And so he had no other choice but to let his dogs finish the journey themselves. And so they once again, they continued off into the dark, frozen Alaska night. It was early in the morning by the time Balto and his team pulled into Nome. And everyone in the every, everyone in the town was still fast asleep. 
and I, and I, and they, the, the sled pulled in very slowly. And at last they had read, at last they came to a stop. They had made it. Everyone in the town cheered. Balto was too tired to bark, but he was very proud that he had saved all those lives. The doctor ran up to the gunner and took the medicine and immediately went to work. The, for you see, the doctor thought it would have taken them 15 days to get the medicine. But Balto and his team and, and all the other sled dogs had brought the medicine within five days. Listen, everyone, announced Gunner. Here's a song for Balto. Said the, said the doctor of Nome to everyone, it's no use. The snow is to the journey's too long, and it is, and that is no excuse. But Balto and his sled dogs to the trip in record time, and we brought the medicine to the town of Nome. Balto loved it, especially the last part. He when he was a very proud and happy dog, and the doctor immediately went to work and gave everyone the medicine and cured them from diphtheria. And the town of Nome was saved, thanks to Balto, the bravest dog ever. And a, and a true, and, and, the, and you can still see the race to this day, called everyone was so grateful that the Iditarod, that the, that the town of Nome announced that they would have a race in honor of, the, of that famous dog and that historical event. That race became the Iditarod sled race. And to this day, and, and as for Balto, well, the city, of the, the city of New York City put up a statue of Balto right in Central Park. You can still see the statue to this day. And when you do, you will remember Balto, a very brave dog who did a very brave deed. The end. And I bet you will have something for us when it comes to anecdotes, anything, a, a small little story or something that you know very well and you'd like to share with us when it comes to the theme hero. And I believe Judy might just have something to share with us. Well, hi, thank you. I was just going to mention something about my dad. I think everyone has a dad as a hero. But before I get to that, I was going to say today I was just going through my mom's stuff. Both of my parents passed away more than 20 years ago. And my mom worked for the Republican Party in Bear County a long, long time ago. And I found this. So I just thought I'd share that. I know you didn't want to talk about elections, but um, my dad was one of those people who was very curious. He would collect seeds by the side of the road and plant them just to see what grew. And he served in the South Pacific in World War II as an airplane mechanic. And one of his stories is patching an aircraft using a bed sheet and some epoxy paint. But he was that kind of person. And his curiosity was one of the things that he bequeathed to my sister and I. And in fact, we were, we were Navy brats. Every time we moved, we would stop driving through Arizona or New Mexico and pick up the rocks. And he would always stop and let us collect the rocks. So I figure that's why I'm a geologist today and I get to work with moon rocks at NASA. But the anecdote part that I wanted to tell you, when he passed away, he was almost 90. And in the funeral home, he was laid out in a coffin and people came by to tell me stories about him from the past. And while we were standing there, there was a fly buzzing around because there was kind of a sweet spell that kind of goes with funeral homes. And my cousin, uh, we made a joke about closing up the fly inside the casket. 
And my cousin turned around and she said, he would have found that interesting. Oh, from the heart, wonderful. Thank you so much, Judy. That was amazing. I'm wondering if there's anyone else out there, John Hale, that might have an anecdote that you would like to share. Okay, John, you're up. All right. My mom took a trip to Hawaii with several other ladies and they are quite senior. And when they walked up to the beautiful surf and they watched the surfers out there to the left and out there to the right. And then right behind them came this beautiful young lady with dark hair and a ponytail wearing a wetsuit that was red and yellow. And my mom turned to her and said, you look like a superhero. Are you a superhero? And the girl said, aren't we all a little bit of a superhero? And with that, she jumped on into the surf and swam off with her surfboard. So my mom and her friends were kind of sticking their feet in the water and just having a little fun. All of a sudden, this big wave, whoosh, came in and it knocked my mother down. The other two ladies were able to back up, but my mom was in the tide and was rolling back and it, the force was too strong. She could not get up. And the other ladies were saying, get up, be careful, watch out, get up. Then as she struggled in the water, all of a sudden she was picked up by that same surfer girl in that wetsuit. And she picked her all the way up, just gently walked right out of the waves, sat her down on the sand and said, there you go, mate. Apparently she was from Australia. And my mother said, apparently there are superheroes everywhere. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> superheroes are angels, but for sure, that's amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to share an anecdote for our special theme of heroes? Okay, well, then I have a little, it's a story, but I'll try to make it more anecdotal. Um, Judy, this kind of goes right along with you being a Navy brat. I'm an Air Force brat, and most everyone knows that. Oh, John, too. So, so we have so much in common, and I think we don't have enough time to ever talk about it, but um, there was, um, it was 2017, um, Armed Forces Day, May, very hot, but Lackland Air Force Base was having their uh, huge um, air show. And my dad being a uh, retired Air Force, Lieutenant Colonel George G. Berg, he's right behind me in that picture. He, um, it'd been years, I mean, years since he had been to an air show. He flew C 130s um, and, and many other trainer planes um, during his 21 years in the Air Force. But for whatever reason, he had not been for many years. And, and although his mind was wonderful, his body was breaking down. He was 84 years old. It took forever. But finally, my sister and I talked my dad into going. We were going to bring the wheelchair. We were going to bring the walker, anything he needed so that he could see the airplanes that he used to fly. And uh, he finally said he was going to go. But at the very last moment, my mom called and said, nah, George just isn't feeling good. Uh, he'll have to go another year. Well, I can't tell you how disappointed we were because it took a lot of planning. We, we made sure that wheelchair was working. Well, with the help of my sister and me just going right on over there, I finally talked dad into going. Mom came with her umbrella. Every, everybody was ready. And my sister and, and her husband, Sid, and my husband and I, we, we went in two separate cars, but we finally got there to Lackland. Um, while we were on Kelly Drive, you could see this 
this huge nose coming up over one of the hangers. And you could hear the engines. It was my dad who got excited first. He knew exactly what that airplane was. It was his longtime friend, the C-130. His eyes changed. He had not been talking at all while he was in the car. He put that whole face of his up against the window. He watched that airplane maneuver itself with his four huge engines and turn itself up into the sky. Oh my gosh, at that moment, dad was a changed man. He was young again. We finally got there uh, with the help of a shuttle and we got dad in his um, wheelchair and, and we had all the grandkids with us. We met it with my sister and it was about a quarter of a mile before we could actually get to the parked C-130. But in the meantime, he met all of his old time friends, the, the B-25 bomber, the B-26 marauder, the B-29 super fortress. They were all planes that he had flown. But his friend, his longtime friend, the C-130, was sitting there in all its majesty. And once we finally got there, it was a quarter of a mile down the road. The plane was open in the back. And I mean, 50 to 100 people were entering the back end of that plane all at one time because it was a huge cargo plane. And boy, are there stories that my dad told. And while dad sat there in the shade underneath one of the wings, I saw Chuck go and talk to one of the airmen right by the, the front of the plane. He had no idea what he was saying. But within seconds, this airman walked right up to my dad and, and made sure my dad could see him. And, and dad immediately straightened up his Air Force cap that he was wearing and saluted that airman, as the airman had saluted him. The airman asked if he could have the honor of having my dad go up into the cockpit and talk to the pilot. In the meantime, the pilot had gone on up and was sitting up there waiting for dad. Now, it took a little bit of maneuvering, but we moved that wheelchair with my husband's help and my brother-in-law's help right up to the stairs. And with the help of both of them, they got dad up the stairs that got to the stairs of the cockpit. Dad turned around and he was a changed man. His entire back had straightened up. His two ruined knees that had been redone twice straightened up. He grew six feet. He, he, his age disappeared. He was 25, 26. He was in that uniform I remember seeing him in. It was that one piece uniform, so handsome. He let me stand on his shoes and walk with him to the door and give me a big kiss. It all came back. He stood by himself and he walked up those steps by himself, those, those metal handles he, he held like he knew them well. His feet, they walked right over where they needed to be and he sat next to that pilot and they talked and they talked and they talked. Now my husband Chuck had gone up there and heard some of the stories he was telling about um, one of the missions that he flew and, and saving five of the people that were out there in the jungle in Vietnam and with that C-130 he was able to bring it on down, turn itself around for there wasn't an airfield, it, it, it was jungle. And he had opened up the back and the men were to jump in and, and they did. The only thing is the enemy had shot off the wing and moved that plane to where there were minefields everywhere. Well, there was another plane, another American plane waiting for him and was able to circle itself around, come on down and go ahead and get all those men onto the other airplane. And, and of course he's telling this story and how scared he was and it, it was amazing. We, we got him back down, mostly by himself, got him back into the wheelchair. And while holding the hands of his, of his grandkids and us pushing him, that memory, that smile, those stories of that day were told almost every day when we would visit him. It was a moment he'd never forget. And it was a way for him to say goodbye to his good friends one last time. He passed away in 2019, 
15. But I tell you, he still had that Air Force cap with him when he passed away. That's how much the life of the Air Force meant to him and his family. We loved him so much. And so for Veterans Day, um, we thank all our armed forces for everything that they've done and everything they're doing. And with that, it is eight o'clock. So I think that is the 